Philippians chapter 4, beginning at the uh, beginning of the chapter and reading through verse 9. And pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Well, as probably some of you, if not many of you, know, the author of our Belgic confession was a man by the name of Guido de Bray. And um, he has a very interesting life, as you can imagine. Uh, but toward the end of his life, he was arrested and thrown into prison for his Protestant faith. And uh, during this time in prison, he wrote a letter to his wife on April 12 of 1567, a letter to his wife, knowing that this might be the last letter he would ever have a chance to send her, knowing that these might be the last words he would ever have a chance to say to her. And as you can imagine, he doesn't spend too much time talking about things that are not all that important. He doesn't talk to her about the weather or about things that don't really have any eternal consequence. He chooses his words very carefully. It reads in a lot of ways like a letter from Paul. There's an opening greeting. He uh, expounds some gospel truths. He gives some exhortations, asking her to take care of their children, to keep her normal routine after he's gone. And then at the end, he asks her to, say, to give greetings to some of their family and friends. This is, uh, he, a month and a half later, uh, was, was hanged for his, for his faith. These were some of the last words that he was able, ever able to say to her. And, uh, and he did indeed choose his words carefully. Well, Debray in this situation was in a similar situation to the one that Paul was in as he was writing the letter to Philippians, as you all know. Paul was in prison, awaiting a trial, uh, probably in Rome, that would decide whether he would live or die. And as he writes this letter to the Philippians, this church that he loves dearly, he wants to choose his words very carefully. He knows that these, these may be the last words he will ever have a chance to give to this church that he loves so much. And he does love them dearly. Look at the words that he uses in verse 1. He calls them brothers. He says he loves them and longs for them, that they are his joy and crown. He says they are beloved to him. He loves this church dearly. And so he does choose his words carefully, just like Debray did in his last letter to his wife. He wants to leave this Philippian church that he loves with final exhortations and encouragements as this could be the last chance he has to do this. Verse 1 of our passage sets the agenda, really, for the rest of these, uh, these opening nine verses of chapter 4. As Paul exhorts the Philippians to stand firm or to persevere in the Lord, notice that he begins this verse with, therefore, this very important beginning. What that tells us is that this command that Paul gives to stand firm, these specific applications that he gives. These flow from everything that Paul has said in the letter up to this point. He's grounding the commands of this passage and all the many 
uh, wonderful expositions of the gospel that he has given in this letter, that he has laid out for the Philippians thus far. Stand firm because Christ has humbled himself to accomplish your salvation, that passage that we read earlier in our service. Stand firm, Paul says, because Christ's righteousness is yours by faith alone. Remember that wonderful passage from chapter 3. And stand firm, he says, because you are citizens of heaven and you have the hope of Christ's return and the resurrection on the last day. At the end of chapter 3, the verses just preceding these ones. And notice that Paul says, stand firm in the Lord. This is not just that Christ has accomplished such a great salvation outside of the Philippians and now they need to take it from there. No, his righteousness is theirs by faith. And now they stand firm in the union that they have with Christ by virtue of the strength which he provides through the Holy Spirit. And in these verses that we are considering today, Paul reminds the Philippians as he commands them to stand firm that they are in Christ, that Christ is the one who empowers them in this. We find in this passage three specific ways in which Christ commands, exhorts the Philippians to stand firm or persevere in their faith. Three exhortations that he wants to leave ringing in their ears as he brings this letter to a close in this passage and the next. First, we find that he exhorts them to stand firm by agreeing in the Lord in verses 2 and 3, by agreeing in the Lord. <coughs> Second, he exhorts them to stand firm by rejoicing in the Lord in verses 4 through 7. And third, he exhorts them to stand firm by setting their minds on what is excellent, by thinking about, meditating on what is excellent and what is worthy of praise. So these will then be our three points for today. Agree in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, and think about these things, these three ways in which Paul exhorts the Philippians in this, uh, in this last section of exhortations. So our first point, agree in the Lord. Paul mentions two women here in verse 2, Euodia and Syntyche, and we don't know who these women were. We don't know much about them, their roles in the church. We don't even know exactly what their disagreement was about. Now, it's possible, based on uh, things that we've seen earlier in the book of Philippians, that uh, they were having a disagreement over the leadership in the church, maybe, over the <laughs> strategy of the church. And it's certainly easy to imagine, isn't it, two godly women in a church who both care deeply about the spread of the gospel in Philippi and who have two very different visions for how the church should go about doing this. But we don't know for sure what the disagreement was over. But it is serious enough that Paul feels the need to mention it specifically, mention them by name uh, at the end of this letter. And so this means that it was almost certainly beginning to affect the entire congregation, whether it was causing uh, the people in the congregation to form factions and take sides or something of that sort. But it was beginning to affect the Philippian congregation in some way as Paul writes it in his letter to the whole church. And he says, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Literally, what this says is, I entreat you, Odia, and Syntyche to think the same in the Lord. And this is one of the great emphases in the book of Philippians, is on the Christian mindset, the way the Christian thinks. In the opening, in Paul's opening to the letter, he introduced this theme. He said that he thinks rightly about the Philippians, that he has a proper mindset toward them. At the beginning of chapter 2, Paul says, complete my joy by being of the same mind or thinking the same. This is the same language that we find here in our passage today. This common mindset brings unity. Just a few verses later, he says, with the same language, have this mind or think this among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Their mindset should reflect the humble mindset of Christ. And then at the end of chapter 3, he contrasts the proper mindset of the Christian, which is set on Christ, set on their eternal citizenship and on their resurrection, their hope in the resurrection, with the mindset of the enemies of the cross, whose minds are set on earthly things. And now he says again, he exhorts Yodi and Syntyche, the same uh, language, the same exhortation that he has been uh, that he has been exhorting again and again throughout this letter to think, 
think the same in the Lord, to have a common mindset in the Lord. He exhorts them to stand firm, to persevere in the Christian life by agreeing in the Lord. And this unified mindset, which he exhorts Yuri and Syntyche to, is because their union with Christ has significant implications for how they think and therefore how they act toward one another. If their minds are not set on earthly things, if they are focused on Christ as their supreme treasure and goal, this will change naturally how they act toward one another, how they think toward about one another. Because their mindset has been changed by the Holy Spirit, they are able to agree and find unity with each other. And I don't think that this is a shallow agreement that Paul is uh, that Paul is encouraging them toward here, where Paul just makes one of them give in to the other one. Paul is not saying to them, just play nice while you think bad things about one another. No, this is an agreement uh, as those who have been reconciled to one another by the word and the spirit of Christ. This is an agreement that comes from a common bond that they share in Christ, a unity as sisters in Christ, both redeemed, righteous, and united to Christ, their head. And so even if they do have disagreements, they will think of one another as citizens of heaven. They will act with the humility of Christ toward one another, and they will love one another as Christ has loved them. Now notice in verse 3 that this command to agree is not the responsibility of Euodia and Syntyche alone. Paul says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Paul specifically asks here someone who he calls true companion to help in the reconciliation of these women. And commentators have all kinds of guesses about who this true companion might be. Maybe it's Luke, the same Luke who wrote the gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. Uh, It's possible He stayed in Philippi after he and Paul were there, um, after Paul planted a church there. After uh, that section in Philippi, the the we, the first person plural, changes to to I, uh, so that's possible that Luke stayed behind. Maybe it's a proper name like Joy or Christian. It could be one of the leaders in the church, probably is one of the leaders in the church, as Paul specifically mentions the overseers in the Uh, opening to this letter. But Paul asks this true companion to help in the reconciliation of these women, to help Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord, to, uh, to find unity in the Lord. And he appeals again to the unity that they share because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now earlier in the letter, you may remember Philippians 1, 27, Paul says, "...only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ." So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And the imagery that Paul is evoking here in this verse is of a row of soldiers advancing side by side in unison, not split apart, not divided by anything, but in total lockstep with one another. This Uh, unity that Paul is calling Euodia and Syntyche to, this unity that he's calling the true companion to to aid them in, is this unity which they ought to have as, as these soldiers that Paul is describing, advancing side by side, not broken apart by anything, as those united to all those who put their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fellow soldiers, fellow Labors, and in, Paul, and in fact, Paul does mention fellow laborers in the gospel. He specifically mentions Clement and other co-laborers whose names are in the book of life. He's calling them saints, fellow citizens of heaven. They are all united by this common bond which is created by the word and the spirit as they seek to spread the same gospel to the ends of the earth. And brothers and sisters, this is a common bond that we share as Christians As well, as Euodia and Syntyche could agree in the Lord as they were united to one another, united to Christ by word and spirit, our union with Christ allows us to share this common mindset 
this common bond as well to agree in the Lord. There are certainly many things that Christians will and have and will continue to disagree on, aren't there? Politics, social issues, theological differences, strategies for a church, how to educate our children, and a host of other things. But we are bound together by the Holy Spirit, united to Christ as he is held out for us in the gospel. So even in those things that we disagree on, we are called to a common mindset in Christ as fellow soldiers, as fellow citizens of heaven. We're not called to agree on every last issue, just as Paul was not asking Euodia and Syntyche to agree on every last issue, but rather to agree in the Lord, to have a common mindset that is focused ultimately on Christ. And this means practically that our differences don't define our relationships with one another, but rather the relationship is as brother and sister, sons and daughters of the same Heavenly Father, co-heirs, along with our elder brother, Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you, Santa Clarita, URC, might be a church characterized not only or primarily by superficial agreement, but by a deep and powerful bond created by the Holy Spirit through the gospel, a church characterized by love and humility, by laying down your lives in service to one another. And if you do have a disagreement with someone, this is a great opportunity to serve that person, for Christ's love to be on display in and through you, for the unity of believers to be put into action. So may we agree in the Lord. And that brings us then to our second point, rejoice in the Lord. As many of you uh, have probably noticed at this point in going through the book of Philippians, there's almost no word that is more associated with the book of Philippians than joy and then language of rejoicing. This is such significant language in, in Philippians. But when you take a step back and think about it, there's some irony, there's something kind of odd about the fact that joy is so intimately associated with this book given the actual situation that Paul was in and given the actual situation that the Philippians were in. Remember that Paul is suffering, imprisoned, awaiting a trial. The Philippians have several big sources of anxiety as well, this disagreement with Euodia and Syntyche. Paul's talked about opponents that they have, both inside and outside the church, who are persecuting them, who are uh, perhaps proclaiming a different gospel or some kind of deviant form of the, of the gospel. It seems that uh, perhaps some Philippians were unhappy with the leadership in their church or the direction of the church. Maybe they were facing social pressures, financial issues. We get a hint of that in the next uh, passage, the last passage in, in chapter 4. Now, we certainly don't want to overstate the dire situation of the Philippians. Paul calls them partners in the gospel. He uh, notes that they're some of his most faithful and sacrificial supporters, but it's certain, though, that they were in need of help. And many people, when they read Philippians, because of all the language of joy and rejoicing, assume that everything is wonderful with Paul and the Philippian church. But this makes the fact that Paul emphasizes joy in this letter all that much more surprising. As Paul and the Philippians face difficulties and challenges and suffering, Paul says that the solution to anxiety begins with rejoicing in the Lord. In verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He repeats it. He really wants the Philippians to rejoice. And this is not a superficial happiness in the things of this world that Paul is advocating here. This is a command to rejoice always at all times. So it can't just be happiness. As you and I know, happiness comes and goes. No, this is very different. This is rejoicing in the Lord. And again, we can return to all those wonderful gospel truths that Paul has proclaimed to the Philippians. This is the basis of their rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord in who he is, in what he has done, in all that he is doing in them. This is why they're able to rejoice always, because Christ's work is finished. Because they have the hope of eternal life, secure ready for them. Their salvation is secure. He goes on to say, let your reasonableness 
be known to everyone. In other words, let your forbearing spirit be known to everyone. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. He's exhorting them here to a, a spirit of contentment. And rejoicing naturally leads to a spirit of contentment, doesn't it? If we're rejoicing in Christ that our salvation is secure in him, then we won't insist on our own way. We won't be constantly worried about our own wants or getting, what, getting the things that, uh, that, that we think we need. We will be content. We'll have the attitude that Paul commends to the Philippians in chapter 2, the attitude of Christ that we read about in our gospel reading earlier. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So rejoicing in the Lord manifests itself in an attitude of contentment that looks outside of ourselves and around ourselves to the needs of others, that humbly seeks not only our own good, but also the good of others, and that imitates Christ who did this perfectly. This is the attitude that Paul was exhorting Euodia and Syntyche to have toward one another. Now Paul says that the Lord is near at the end of verse 5. And this is all the more reason to rejoice, isn't it? The fact that the Lord is near. All the more reason to uh, be content, to exhibit an attitude of humility in dealing with others. Christ will return soon. He will set everything right. And the Philippian Christians will dwell with him forever. And so even if they are wronged, even if they are being persecuted, they can bear this with joy, knowing that Christ will return soon and will vindicate them. And this promise that the Lord is near also serves as motivation for the next verse, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. As we've talked about, the Philippians and Paul had plenty of reasons to be anxious, plenty of reasons to worry. But Paul says to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord because your salvation is secure. Look outside of yourselves. Hope in the return of Christ, the Lord is near. And if you are still anxious for your needs, if you are still experiencing anxiety, if you are still worried, pray. He says, pray. Prayer is one of the main ways that we can rejoice in the Lord. This is what our catechism says, doesn't it? That prayer is the main part of our thankfulness, which we owe to God. Paul says, pray to the Lord and give thanks. Ask for joy in his salvation, a spirit of forbearance that his kingdom would come soon. Thank him for his love and kindness, for his faithfulness, and for his salvation, which he has won. And then Paul wonderfully tells us the promised result of this prayer and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we look to Christ and rejoice in him, as we look outside of ourselves to the needs of others, as we hope in the return of Christ, as we pray, giving thanks to God, even amidst trials and sufferings, God promises to grant peace, a peace which surpasses all understanding. In other words, a peace which is inexplicable given the current situation, except that it is from God. And again, this imagery that Paul is using here is military imagery, just like he used earlier in the book. The imagery is that of being in a city which is under attack on all sides, which is which is being uh, sieged on all sides, that there are arrows coming toward the city, that there are soldiers attacking it. And yet, as you're standing inside that city, you have such firm confidence in the walls of the city and in the soldiers guarding the city that you are not worried for one moment that the city will fall. This is the kind of guarding that Paul is talking about here. The peace of God which he gives an answer to prayer, is more impenetrable, is more secure than a city guarded even by Roman soldiers, the most powerful army on earth. The Philippians would have understood this. They had Roman soldiers guarding Philippi. They would have understood this imagery, but Paul says this is even more powerful, this peace which God promises. 
will guard them. All of us, brothers and sisters, I'm sure, are anxious about something. And as you experience anxiety, pray to your Heavenly Father who loves you, knowing that He is in control of all things, knowing that He is your Father for the sake of Christ, His Son, knowing that you are at peace with God, that Christ has reconciled you to God, that we are at peace with one another, that your salvation is secure, that Christ is yours and that you are Christ's. And so let us rejoice always, as Paul exhorts here. We turn then to think about our last point. Think about these things in verses 8 and 9. And these may be, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of the final things that Paul will ever have a chance to say to the Philippian church. This is his mindset as he's writing this letter. He's called them now, as we saw in our first two uh, sections, to stand firm in unity, now to, and then to stand firm in uh, rejoicing. And now he calls them to stand firm once more, to persevere once more by living a life of obedience, in imitation of Paul, and most of all, in imitation of of Christ. Paul closes these exhortations with a list of virtues, things which the Philippians should dwell on, things which they should meditate on, and then things which they should put into practice in their lives. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have heard and what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I wanted to read that list of virtues again. It is such an incredible list of virtues, things that we should dwell on and meditate on, things that we should set our minds on, set our focus on. This again takes us back to that Christian mindset that Paul has been talking so much about in the book of Philippians. These are things that should characterize the Christian mindset, this list of virtues. Paul says, notice whatever is true, whatever is honorable, and so forth. And so Paul is not only commanding the Philippians to set their minds on uh, scripture or on things that are explicitly Christian necessarily, although certainly Scripture is all these things. But he's saying meditate on whatever exemplifies these things, because all truth is God's truth. All that is lovely is lovely because it reflects the beauty of our Creator. All that is just is just because it is measured by God's perfect standard of justice. Perhaps there is a, perhaps this could be for you a book a piece of music or art, uh, if you're more inclined to the engineering side, a, uh, the solution to a very complicated math problem or a scientific discovery. Things that we should dwell on and give thanks to God for because they reflect Him. Now we need, of course, as we think about this, to be cautious consumers of culture and of the things around us, as there is so much that is not true and not honorable and not lovely. But these are the things, the things that are, the things that exemplify these things, Paul commends to us. We need to recognize also, as Paul makes so clear here, that the things that we meditate on shape us. Notice the flow of thought in Paul's, uh, in these last two verses here. In verse 8 he says, meditate on these things. And in verse 9 he says, practice them. And it's because there's a natural connection that Paul recognizes here between the things that we think about and how we act. This is how God has made us, that the things that we do with our body affects our minds and the things that we think about affects how we act. This is how God has created us. We need to seek out those things which are true and pure and lovely and so on. This is one of the reasons that it's so important to attend church every week. We need to be shaped most of all by the Word of God because we know that this is completely true, completely pure, completely lovely. This is what we need to be shaped by most of all.
so that our minds are filled with these things and we learn to discern them where we find them around us. Notice that Paul points the Philippians to himself as an example. He exhorts them to follow his teaching, what they have received and learned from him, but also imitate his example, imitate his actions, what they have heard and seen in him. And so I would encourage you as well to look around you at those who exemplify these virtues. There are certainly many people in your congregation, many uh, mature and um, wonderful saints who exemplify these virtues. These are people that you should look to and imitate in the way that they in the way that they exemplify these things. As Paul exhorted the Philippians to imitate himself and as Paul imitated Christ. And ultimately, of course, as we think about these virtues, it does lift our minds. It does cause us to, to lift our minds to the one who embodied all these things perfectly, to the one who is the very embodiment of excellence and of virtue and of all that is worthy of praise, our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul ends this last section with an incredible promise. He says, And the God of peace will be with you. Notice here that he inverts what he said in verse 7. There he said, The peace of God will be with you. Now not only is the peace of God with them, does he promise that peace of God, but the God of peace himself will be with them. This was Christ's promise to his disciples and to the whole church as he sat in that upper room we read in the last uh, or in the in the um, in John 13 uh, through 16 or so, um, as he was in that upper room with his disciples, he promised to send the Holy Spirit as a helper. He said to them, "I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you." Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, the God of peace Himself, the one who embodies all of these virtues perfectly gives us his peace through the Holy Spirit. This is Paul's promise. What a comforting and wonderful promise that is. As we come to a close now, brothers and sisters, this passage is a call to the Philippians, Paul's final exhortations to this church as he begins to draw this letter to a close. This passage is a call to us as well to stand firm in the Lord, to persevere in the Christian life and the strength which Christ provides by the Holy Spirit. We are to stand firm in our unity with one another, recognizing that the unity which we have in Christ by word and spirit transcends all that divides us. We are to stand firm to persevere in our rejoicing, knowing that Christ has accomplished our salvation and that he is indeed returning soon. And so we must rejoice looking outside of ourselves to our neighbors, to our brothers and sisters in love. And if we do experience anxiety, and we will in this sinful world, we ought to pray with thanksgiving to the Lord who promises to grant us his peace. And we must also stand firm in our obedience, meditating on, dwelling on, thinking about all that is excellent and worthy of praise, and so practicing these things, putting them to practice in our lives as well. In all of this, let us look to Christ, the one who has accomplished our salvation, and the one who is even now at work in us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, thank you for the salvation which we have in Jesus Christ, for his life, death, and resurrection, and for the wonderful hope of his return on the last day. Thank you that we are united to Christ, and it, uh, it is as those who have the Spirit of Jesus Christ and are united to him that we are commanded to stand firm. Please help us to stand firm in our unity with one another as fellow citizens of heaven, as those who share a bond with Christ by the Holy Spirit. Please help us to, share, uh, to stand firm in our rejoicing in Christ and in his salvation. Help us to look to the needs of others and not only to ourselves. And when we are anxious, may we pray to you and find peace in the knowledge that you are in control of all things and that we have peace with you and with one another because of Christ's finished work. Help us also to meditate and dwell on all that is excellent and worthy of praise. May we give you thanks for these things and may they cause us to lift our minds to Christ, the one who embodies all of these things perfectly. Thank you that not only do you grant us peace which surpasses all understanding, but that you, the God of peace, 
Give us your peace through your Son, by the Holy Spirit. Amen.